Hi, everyone. This is Scott Cantrell. Welcome to this episode of Consulting with Authority, joined by another friend and expert, uh, someone that uh, had a great conversation with a few weeks ago and am excited to bring him to the podcast today. I want to introduce to you John Alden from uh, Mountain State Sales Solutions. He's based in Denver, Colorado. He is the founder and chief sales officer. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Scott, great to be here. Excellent. So uh, let's begin at the beginning, um, or as far back as you want to go, John. <laughs> what uh, what was the nature of your work that brought you to where you are? I know you've done a whole lot of work over the last uh, uh, two to three decades in the sales space and in the sales management realm. Tell us a little, little bit about the background and how you got to where you are with this uh, consulting firm that you have uh, founded now. We won't go all the way back to the beginning, but we will go back to uh, maybe some high school days. That where, yeah. um, you know, sometimes you get labeled and I was labeled a natural salesperson by just a lot of different folks. Um, I was always exceeding and, and winning all of the candy bars and holiday <laughs> gift cards, sales contests you had for, you know, the football team I was on or yeah. the basketball team I was on. And that led me to, um, to go to work uh, for a department store. And okay. uh, I worked my way into being the youngest commissioned salesperson in that company's history. Wow. Um, you know, from there, uh, went on to college. And then I came out of college knowing that I wanted to um, go to work in sales. Uh, I grew up in the Rochester area, uh, in the Rochester, New York area. In that area, two main employ- employers at the time were Kodak and Xerox. Um had some friends and family that worked for Xerox and I started my then professional career with Xerox and I worked my way up through uh, the management uh, chain in in Xerox really held every position that you're supposed to have from account manager to product specialist to uh, first line regional sales manager to solutions manager to into a director role. Uh, I had a nice 18 year career with Xerox and then uh, when that came to an end, decided to uh, go to work for a smaller company in a different segment. I really wanted to learn the software business. But in addition to that, I wanted to go to work for a smaller company. Mm-hmm. Um, I really was exposed to big company logic, Fortune 100 training, Fortune 100 thought processes. And I really wanted to, to, to see what it was like to work for a much, much smaller company. Sure. So I was hired on uh, into the software world. Uh, VP of sales, um, built uh, the sales infrastructure for them, uh, the coverage model, the compensation plans, defining the sales process, selected a CRM for them, uh, hired the sales force and grew the business. And ultimately the company was sold. And that left me uh, figuring out what to do next. I stayed on a couple of years uh, to help with transition Mm -hmm. and then moved on to Mountain State Sales Solutions, where I am powered, it's powered by Sales Acceleration. Uh, I work with small to mid-sized companies to identify, uh, fix, and solve uh, their sales challenges. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I would imagine that the lessons that you learned in both of those types of segments, right? The, like you said, the Fortune 100, where at the time, uh, and even still today, but specifically at the time, I mean, Xerox it, like I said, is and was a beast, specifically in the sales world. And sure. so I would imagine there was a whole lot of very, very good sales training in that segment. At the same time, what you, what I have been told, I haven't worked directly in that, uh, that stratosphere of, of organizations. I've had some of them as my clients, but I haven't worked directly in those organizations. Sure. But from what I've heard is that even though the sales training is very, very um, strong, a lot of what you learn and how how the sales process works doesn't doesn't exactly transcend downstream into the more you know the smaller businesses principles may be the same but how the nature of the sales process and the sales cycle is quite different maybe speak to that a little bit in terms of comparing and contrasting you know fortune 100 with uh, the smaller software firm that you you can yeah. and of course now working with clients that are small and medium size well xerox not only identified and and recruited top salespeople. Yeah. Um, they really did um, develop uh, very, very good 
sales management and align that with strong sales management process. So coming through the door, if you're a, a, a new hire, uh, you would get a tremendous amount of sales training. Mm-hmm. But that sales training was complemented by a very well-trained sales manager and a very defined sales management process that was aligned to the selling process. Yeah. And what I see with smaller companies is that they might hire a new person and put them through some training, but they're not doing as much training for their managers or the leaders of the sales yeah. organization. It's a great point. So yeah. even the best, the best of the best, LeBron James has coach. Right. Yeah. Probably has a few coaches. Mm-hmm. Right. And inside your, 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 as a salesperson, with knowing your sales process, having a good coach, mentor, manager to complement that goes a long way. It's hard to put a percentage on it, but in the Xerox world, I did, what I saw over time is that a really good manager could improve a team by 20 points and a real manager, very bad, poor manager, which very seldom you ran, ran across, could probably decline the business by 20 points. But that's it because the process of that large organization would keep that moving forward. Yeah. No, I think that's excellent. And your note about uh, sales training versus sales management training, I think is a really, really important one. Um, I'm on the, as we've talked about, I'm on the marketing side of the sales equation. So teeing up the opportunities, hopefully that they get knocked down by sales is the thing that I help my clients work on. And, and I will say one of the things that my clients either know it's a problem, don't really know how to, how to solve it, which is where you come in or they don't have a perception that it's an issue. And that is they've got a sales team or one or two salespeople, but they don't really have an effective management process for those individuals. Um, And so they're expecting these individuals to figure it out on their own and to enhance and improve, you know, continuous improvement on their own without access to a coach, like you said, which I think is um, maybe they'll see incremental or marginal improvement over a long period of time, but not nearly what they could see if they had that leader and that sales management process in person that was, uh, of course, holding them accountable, but also giving them guidance and empowering them to, to, to do better. Um, so to that end, that kind of brings us into the work that you're doing now. Um, uh, tell us a little about, about the firm. And specifically, there's really three questions. Um, and we can kind of take each one of these in turn. Who do you work with? What is the essence of the work that you do with those organizations? Uh, and specifically who, I mean, uh, the titles and positions you work with, specific industries, that type of thing. Um, what is it that you're, how are you serving them on a, on a consistent basis? What are you doing for them? And then uh, maybe a little about your process, how you actually engage with those clients. Sure. Sounds good. So I work with small to mid-sized company. Industry, somewhat agnostic, although I yeah. come from a, you know, selling complex solutions and in, in, in mm-hmm. software. Um, more often than not, they have an outside sales force. So they don't have an inside sales force. And they either have a, uh, a sales leadership team that's maybe running through some challenges or they are run by the CEO. So the CEO is running the company. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, I, I manage the sales department as well. Right. And you ask, well, how did that happen? And they can say, I, I drew the short straw, or they can say, I've, I've always handled that. And then you probe into what they do. And as you know, what I've seen, at least in small to mid-sized companies, people by nature wear multiple hats. Mm-hmm. And if sales are going well and, and the CEO is wearing that cap, they're spending as much time as needed, but not enough time managing the sales organization. Because right. when sales are going well is the time that you're investing uh, in your people, in your process, in the tools, so that you're preventing from really trying to prevent that next downturn in business. And usually when that downturn in business happens, they realize they don't have enough information, enough experience uh, with that particular issue to identify what the heck is going on so they can help turn it around. Yeah, it's too late, kind of too late at that point, right? I mean, they, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're being reactive to the external environment as opposed to uh, being proactive in advance. Exactly. So yes, what do I do for them? Mm-hmm. It depends. <laughs> and, I, and I say sure. that very loosely because, you know, at the 30,000 foot level, uh, I, am, I am a fractional VP of sales. Okay. So I may work with them on a fractional basis 
and take ownership of that sales, sales organization, ownership of the results, hiring, firing, sales process, CRM, everything associated with it. And I build and put that infrastructure in place, put the right people in place, and then work with the CEO, president of the company, leadership team on finding a future sales leader for them. I'm not signing five-year agreements where I'm the VP, as factional VP of sales for that amount of time. I'm usually in there to fix a specific issue, get the things in place, get the leader in place, and then check in on with them on a regular basis to make sure things are going well. Yeah, that's excellent. That makes perfect sense. That's at the 30,000 foot level, everything included. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, um, I can do very specific statement of works. Uh, they have an issue with the coverage model. They need to hire the sales leader. They need to hire salespeople. They need to work on compensation plans. They need to find a CRM. So anything related to the infrastructure of the organization, the tools that they use, the processes that they follow, I'm engaged with. Now, what I'm not engaged with if I'm not running the sales organization would be that day in, day out coaching and training. Yeah. Um, if I'm running the organization, obviously, they're gonna, the, the people that work for me will get my coaching and training. But I wouldn't come in and work directly, uh, give sales training to, uh, say, a uh, a rookie salesperson that that's, that's outside the scope of the work. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. Um, tell me a little about from a consulting standpoint, uh, the nature of your engagements are, you mentioned statements of work, uh, is most of your work project based with a delimited period of time for a fixed fee? Have you done anything? I'm just curious. Uh, we haven't really talked about this in advance, John, yeah. but, um, have you done anything on speculation fee plus back end in terms of, performance-based sales work, that type of thing. Just curious about how you uh, engage with the uh, different clients that you work with. So as an outsourced VP of sales or a fractional VP of sales, there is a fixed uh, base to that as well as a variable based on negotiated uh, parameters, uh, yeah. metrics. Mm-hmm. Um, usually it's around revenue. It could be around number of hires. It could be around performance of, of salespeople. That is negotiated. Uh, there's a, a whole series of fixed fee uh, work that we do. And how we get there to determine what they need. We mm-hmm. have multiple assessments that I can do, as well as on-site assessments to understand what's going on. You know, I like the on-site versus the, you know, um, the, the quick hour discovery calls because no matter what my experience so far, you're getting a, a you know, the base issues of what's going on. It, it, it tends to always be a little bit deeper. Yeah. Um, you can get to that through deeper assessments broader assessments, as well as that on-site discovery to really learn and understand what's going on. It, it, you're usually involved a couple of months before you get to that aha moment to really what's driving um, the challenges that they're facing. And I will tell you in the small to mid-sized market, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, when you get to that, part of that problem is the CEO and president of the company because they decided to wear the sales hat as well as the CEO hat and it, the limited bandwidth, mm-hmm. limited time, no process is just a recipe for challenges. Yeah, that makes, uh, I totally get, I totally get that. That's a fun and, qu- it's a fun conversation to have when you have to point out that potentially they're, they're, they're the, problem. the problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, unsurprisingly for you, I'm sure, and unsurprisingly for most of our listeners and viewers, they they probably had this exact same experience we're talking about. Um, On the marketing side of things, it's the same way, right? So oftentimes it is the, uh, depending on the size of the company, of course, but oftentimes it is the the CEO, founder, president, owner, whoever it may be, that is owning all of these um, subordinate tasks like marketing and prospecting and, and, uh, and it's, you know... I totally get why they would start there. Uh, but oftentimes there may be ego or ownership attached to that, hard for them to give it up, um, even if they know they're not particularly good at it, or even if it may not be something they want to do. Uh, sometimes it's still hard. When it comes to business growth and business development, sometimes it's hard for leaders and owners to to give up the reins on And, and it's uh, sometimes what well, you just described, but the opposite of that. It's not that they're not particularly good at it, although you're going to run into scenarios where that's the case. But more often than not, they are the best representative of the company. Oh, well, sure. Uh, From a sales point of view, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and what they tend to do is when engaged by a salesperson saying, I need your help with this, they tend to do it for them. Ah, uh, yeah. 
I got gotcha. you. And and they just run out and they're the best salespeople. And then they then they question or wonder why not all salespeople can perform the way they do. Yeah. Yep. No, you, you know what? What's interesting about that? I, I wasn't working with this client in terms of sales. I was working uh, in the client on the marketing side, but that would happen repeatedly. In fact, there was an owner operator, fantastic uh, salesperson, one of the best I've ever seen in that market. And he would bring on new producers, new salespeople, um, and they would go out with them. They, he would try to train them. But ultimately, what, what ended up very often happening was he would basically just dominate the sales process and they wouldn't, they wouldn't get the opportunity. They would be there to watch, which is, which is valuable to a point, but they never really got the opportunity to, to fly there on on their own. And, uh, and they, and they either burned out or they didn't learn fast enough. And, uh, and the question that he always asked was exactly what you just said, which is, why can't they be like me? Why can't they sell like me? They're watching me. And it's like, well, you know, not everybody's like you. <laughs> uh, yeah, always, and you got to give them yeah. a chance to do their own thing. Well, you love to create an environment where it's a saying, and I don't know if it's a popular saying, it's a saying I use often is bring ugly early. And, and what I what I mean by that is in a, in a sales cycle, especially in a complex, long sales cycle, there's yeah. going to be a lot of ups and downs and there's going to be a lot of guidance, a lot of discussion a lot of agreement on strategy and the salesperson has to have a comfort level to bring not only good news, but, but challenging, disappointing news setbacks so that they can be worked early in yeah. on in the selling process versus why did we lose that deal? And something comes up and say in a post postmortem that if that information was shared only 30 days ago, somebody could have done something or strategy could have been put in place to counter whatever that challenge may be. So you really want to do create that environment where you say, bring ugly early or bring your challenges early yeah. so they can be worked on. And sometimes if the CEO is busy, president's busy, or just by the nature of their title, they, that, per- that salesperson may be unwilling to yeah. table those challenges. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, so I want to shift gears just for a second. Uh, tell me, uh, obviously, we're, you and I are both on the opposite side of the same business development coin. Uh, sure. So I'm fascinated to know how you go about your own sales efforts, your own business development and growth efforts in terms of identifying new opportunities, cultivating them. Maybe give us uh, just a hint of what your, your sure. prospecting process looks like and what your sales process looks like. You, you've, you've given us a little bit about your sales process already. Yeah, sounds good. So um I'm going to tackle this on a couple of different fronts. Great. Um, so I partnered with Sales Acceleration. They're my primary partner in my practice. Um, they provided excellent training uh, in, in the world that we live in, which is, you know, sales consulting to small to mid-sized companies. Mm-hmm. And the best use of our time has been through building a solid referral network. Yeah. Um, joining groups. Referring, uh, ident- identifying your power partners, adding value, helping them out where they need, helping them out with their sales efforts if they have questions and concerns or, or, or need some help. So build you building your power uh, power referral your your network. Second most important, and I I, I would argue that maybe um, there's so so value here. I'm not sure if I would put those ahead, but your current my current clients. Mm-hmm. Most of my referrals today are coming from my current clients. So it stresses the importance of doing a good job for them, mm-hmm. in, do, over-delivering on time, and then having the courage um, or wisdom <laughs> to, to, to ask them to refer you uh, or, or spread the word on their behalf and, yeah. and recognizing them for it. And then the, the third element is just my own um, prospecting. Um, on on LinkedIn, it, it is a uh, it is becoming a fractional VP of sales is probably a little bit behind, say fractional CMOs, fractional CFOs, and just an awareness. But mm-hmm. creating awareness of myself, who I am uh, out there uh, in my market, to um, bring attention to to what I can do. So yeah. those are the prime areas. Now, once once I get an opportunity, you know, I have a CRM. I have, a, I have a selling process. It begins with discovery, understanding what their challenges are, um, 
aligning uh, my offers that fixes their challenges, hopefully at a, a, a price point that works for everybody. Mm-hmm. And ABS, so always be closing, right? Um, um, you got to always be prospecting too in this world. And always right, be that's true. So there's there's a lot of new always added to my uh, to my bag uh, over the last 14 months, but it, it's it's that's good. It's all of the above. No, that's excellent. And so you know, I I love what you said about current clients and specifically the note about wisdom and courage to actually ask for um, the referral business. Looking at the referral network, obviously current clients are going to be a predominant source of referral opportunities in your world, or what would you recommend for someone who is looking to expand their own referral network or, or build their own referral network if they haven't really started yet? What are, where are good sources for, as you, as you said, identifying power partners? Yeah. Well, yeah. What would you recommend? Well, sources, obviously, obviously, it'll depend on the industry that someone's in. Yeah, in general, for sure. Yeah. So depending on what they're doing, I, I, I mean, if well, that's, that's a pretty open question, what you just mm-hmm. asked, because I. 14 months ago, before I started my practice, I did not know that there were networking groups. Just didn't know. I I, I didn't need them. In in the roles that I were in, I just didn't need to create that. So um, I started uh, working with identifying who potentially could be my power partners, fractional CFOs, fractional CMOs, using LinkedIn Navigator uh, with those keywords, those titles. even your own personal business network, friends that you know are in the business community, telling them what you're what you're doing, asking them if if they have any ideas or anybody they can put in touch with, just to get the ball moving. It is an mm-hmm. activity based, um, you know, activity based results. I mean, if if you're not out there having and reaching out to people and talking to people, and having Zoom meetings. Um, you 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 you're gonna you're just gonna spin your wheels. Yeah. So once you have that, are there other other referral networking groups in your geographies that you can join? I'm a member of three. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it may grow to four because what I'm finding is that you're gonna have power partners in each group. Um, you never rule out someone that, that won't be able to bring you a lead. So be educating, getting to know people, getting those people to trust you that are willing to advise you and paying it back and paying it back and paying it back. Yeah. And it is a process. It is a discipline process that you have to go through. And it's an investment of your time up front. And without that investment, I think you'll find that over time that it just won't pan out. You yeah. Know? People aren't just going to refer you because you reached out to them on LinkedIn. Right. They really got to get to know you yeah. and trust you before they refer you. Um, I mean, my experience is exactly the same. And what I'm <clears throat> what I'm hearing you say, which is, you know, uh, the old axiom, you reap what you sow. And so the more the more good that you can sow uh, by helping other people, the more likely they are to help you. And that uh, that's not just a cliche. It's 100 percent true, at least in my experience and in the experience of my clients and obviously yours as well. Uh, so, yeah, and I think it's a lot of times good. people people think, Scott, that it's it's referring you to a potential opportunity. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's 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 beautiful. I mean that that that's that's but it could be just referring you to someone else um that that might be a referral partner yeah. that leads to something else. And you know it's just through conversations that you learn and you say, well I think I need I know that's great that we had a conversation. I'm not sure if we're a great referral process. However, what you just told me about I got to mm-hmm. introduce you to this person here, or yep. at least two other people. They'll remember it, and you'll never know if that will come back to you. Yep, yep. No, I think it's great. Conversations uncover opportunities, um, and if you're not having the conversations, the opportunities stay hidden. Yep, for sure. Um, I want to I want to dive into some of your sales expertise, if you don't mind, because I know that for a lot of the individuals I speak to um, on the marketing side of things, it's. Uh, well, let me just give you this anecdote, and I think you'll be able to appreciate this. So I talked to uh, so many different um, consultants and executive coaches in the B2B space. That's the world that I'm in. And consistently, the refrain that I hear, and it's good for my business, but the refrain that I hear is, if I could just get in front of enough qualified people, I'd be able to I'd close them. 
I close them. If you can get me fry, I can close them. And then so often what happens, and I know you probably had experience with this, they do get in front of the opportunity. And let's assume that the opportunity truly is quality. Uh, because there, there is bad, there is bad marketing out there where you know, you know, you're just churning and burning leads, and that's not necessarily helpful in the world of of consulting. Um, but so often they struggle uh, to have that meaningful sales conversation when they do get in front of a quality opportunity. And so I think it's, I think it's easy to say, well, if I just had more at bats, I would, you know, have more base hits, have more home runs, potentially a grand slam here or there, but it's not, it's not quite so simple. Even if you have a a valuable, a good solid value proposition, being able to articulate that and move a prospect along a process to the point of signature or close is, it is a science, but it's also an art form. So what I'd love for you to talk about is for a consultant, for small business owners, right? Which are the majority of people who are watching and listening to this, what do you see uh, are the common challenges or common traps that those uh, individuals uh, run into on an ongoing basis that, that they need to pay attention to and shore up or, or correct or fix? Let me just clarify. So other consultants out there now put in a position where they need to sell. Yep. What are some some challenges? Yeah, exactly. Challenges and recommendations, you know, either side of the coin, things that yeah. they constantly struggle with and, and maybe some strategies or solutions that you generally see that are most common. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I um, for one thing, I, w- I would say that you have to acknowledge that you're selling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think I know what you mean. That's why I'm laughing because I think... Yeah. So many of my clients don't do that, but but if you I think you will, but go ahead and articulate. Yeah, what, what, what I mean, mean by that is is that you are in a position of of understanding the challenges that your prospect has mm-hmm. or your future potential customers, the services that you offer. You have to propose. You have to align that challenges to the services. You have to propose it, and you have to ask for the business. Mm-hmm. Those things don't happen by themselves. Right, right. You know, so I don't know, I'm, I don't want to oversimplify that, but at the simplest of terms, mm-hmm. you have somebody that's interested in what you do. You have to understand what their pain points are and how it aligns to you. You have to propose it and then you have to ask for the business. You can't just go far as proposing and not asking for the business. Yeah, right. There is a yes, right. You know, and I don't mean that in a, I'll give you an example. I mm-hmm. COVID hit. My wife and I, we've been married a few years, but we didn't have all of the things that we should have had in place for wills and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We met with a lawyer, fantastic, wonderful person, gave us a lot of information, spent a good amount of time, verbally gave a price, and that's the last we heard from him. Wow. And if you're, out, you're listening to this podcast, you're on the, on the call and you, and you have situations where you had a great meeting. You you thought you, you, you had it going in the right direction. You verbally gave a, an offer. You never called. You never followed up. Yeah. Or you gave a proposal and you never followed up. Yeah. You know, so just those things that, you know, you, you, you're you selling for yourself. You're selling yourself. You're selling the services that you offer. If you've spent time with them, you've done discovery, make sure you're closing the loop. Mm-hmm. You know, ask for the business. If they say, no, I went with someone else, ask why. Learn from that. You know, control C, control V, but make sure you make the adjustments along the way. Yeah. Um, but 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 good selling at its best is when there's there's full alignment. When when with what what you have in your bag, what you what you're offering is aligned to what what pain they're going through in a way that they can afford it and you can mm-hmm. deliver on those services, that is an ideal situation. Um, one of which it doesn't come easy. You got, you got to go through those processes. Yeah. Those yeah. You have to work to uh, create that alignment and make sure the prospect understands that alignment, right? Which are two different things. Now, what I find in, in, in my business sometimes mm-hmm. or my practice is that the challenges that they're, that, that are so real, and, and, you know, sometimes I'm the Hail Mary. You know, they've tried three other approaches. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't work. They need help and they need help now. So all those steps, understanding the pain, 
the offering, the proposal, and the closing could come in a very short period of time. And, and I believe in, in our world of consultants, small to mid-sized companies, that, that might be true for everyone if, in fact, that pain is there. And if that pain is not there, you may go through that process. They may remember you, but mm-hmm. there just wasn't enough pain to make to make that yes decision for right you. during that cycle. And so you're hitting on a bunch of things. I've got a couple of notes here that I just kind of want to dive deeper into. Um, one is related to this issue of of that individual not following up with you, <clears throat> and so often what I see in the consultants that I'm working with on the sales side of things is they will talk about, you know, I met with that person and I never heard from them again. Right. And so it's almost like they're putting the, the preponderance uh, on, on, you know, the responsibility for the prospect to follow up with them to close themselves or to, to buy from them as opposed to them to sell. <clears throat> what would you say around that mindset? How do you, how do you start to shift? Is it something you just need to make sure that you're hyper aware of and that you have a follow-up process in place. The other thing that I, I see related to that is sales limbo, yeah. where maybe you have a great meeting one and a great meeting two, and the prospect is like, oh, we'll get back together. And then you, you know, even if you are following up, the prospect always has a reason why we can't get back together and you end up in this sales limbo going back and forth. So maybe speaking to how to, uh, maybe two different questions there, but how to, how to solve the sales limbo problem and, and what, what does that follow-up process need to look like so you don't let a prospect off the hook too soon. Sure. One of the things that that I do that, that I I I'd love to see everyone do, <laughs> which is pre-commit uh, early on in, in a meeting. And what I mean by that is you're there for a reason. Mm-hmm. You got to have a, an objective of the call. You got to have a desired outcome of the call. Why not set that up in a pre-commit? We're here to review the challenges. I'm yeah. going to talk about some of the offerings that I have. If we feel that there is a fit and we agree to that, establish what that next step is in that meeting. Make it yeah. easier for yourself. Yeah. Set it up. So pre-commit, pre-commit to a next step. Talk about it in the beginning of the call. Wrap up with it at the end of the call. Define it, schedule it, move forward. You'd be surprised that you just leave a meeting with an agreed upon idea of something that you would do, but without the, that defined timeline of what it would be, you, you're making it easier for that potential client to go in a different direction, to get on a different stack of mail. Yeah. And one of your one of your goals is to keep that that process moving on an agreed upon timeline. Not some salespeople, I like, I like I like to get them to work on my timeline. Yep. I say, you no, know, your timeline, their timeline, and agreed upon timeline is is ideal. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's fantastic. I think if someone didn't get anything else from this session, which I've already got two pages of notes, so I, there's a lot here. But if somebody didn't get anything else from this, this idea of pre-committing to the next step early and set, you know, what I'm hearing you say is set the condition for what dictates the next step before you even begin the current step. In other words, if you're having a discovery meeting, like you said, if there's clear alignment between your challenges and our services and there's a clear fit, here's what the next step looks like. Does that process make sense to you, right? You know, And get them to commit, of course. Okay, great. Now you know exactly what condition you have to meet during that first meeting to get to the next step. And the client or the prospective client already knows what the next step is and what's coming down the pack, pack uh, the pike. You don't even have to ask them, right? Uh, now you'll, you'll remind them at the end what happens next, but you don't have to ask them. Let's go back to timeline because this is something else. I consistently hear um, uh, consultants talk about, and to be fair, I fall into this trap too often myself, talk about, oh, my sales cycle six months long or 12 months long or whatever it may be. And I, that could just be a definition thing. But when I think about sales cycle, I think about the initial opening conversation to the point where the pro- where the prospect says, yes, let's get started. No, let's not get started. Um, or let's not get started right now. Now is not a good time. And I want to get to one of those three answers as reasonably quickly as I can. Uh, that's how I define sales cycle. One of the things you mentioned was keeping that process going until you get to the end of it, as opposed to letting it stall. Um, 
do you have a, and I know it would depend on business. I know it depend on the industry and the businesses that are served, but do you have kind of a rule of thumb for how long a sales cycle should be or a timeline if, for consultants? Maybe you just think about in our world, what would you expect uh, a, a business leader to be able to make a decision on if they're faced with my offering or your offering or the average quote unquote consultants offering? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Um, I have a, I have my answer but not in the consulting world. You know? Okay. Okay. I'm, sure, I'm yeah. sure it changes yeah. uh, from time to time, but you know, your best tool to understand the length of your sales cycle is one, a clear definition of when a sales cycle starts mm-hmm. and when it ends and a tool to measure that like yep. a CRM system. Yep. Yep. And you know, a sales cycle from my training, this is just my belief on it. Sure. Begins when, yeah, are they in a buying window? Yes. Are they in it in a buying window for a product that you offer? Yes. Now, what your sales process will determine is, are you going to buy from me? Yeah. Right. So it's that that little bit more of an interest. I, I'm in the market. I've been I'm able to define the timeline that they're going to buy, mm-hmm. and I'm in the hunt. Meaning, I'm I'm they're going to be looking at my product and services. To me, that moves it from interest over to development. Yeah. What, what in your process do you have to develop that opportunity? Because if you go from interest to close and you haven't developed it, that that could be <laughs> problematic. Yeah. It could could be. Usually is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, if you go through your process and you define it, and there's reason to move forward, committing or asking for that business makes your life a lot lot, lot easier. Mm-hmm. So I always tend to believe I started with Xerox. They put you in a, in a demo room and there was a desktop copier and it was a 5614. I remember the model <laughs> and they wanted you to be able to demo the 5614. Well, in the same room was this thing called a DocuTech, right? It was, you know, the size of a Mack truck <laughs> and they're just taking to the process. And I just asked the trainer a question. I said, is it the same process for that thing over there? Right. You know, exact same process. So, so why don't we move over there and start talking about that thing? Yeah. Because that's a half a million dollars and this is $8,000 <laughs> or whatever it was at yeah. the time. Be- because it is an interest development commitment. Now, what you do might be a little bit different, but the process is the same. The same. Yeah, that's good. Uh, the other place I want to go is you, you obviously you have incredible expertise and experience in the sales management world. Um, a lot of small businesses, specifically, again, thinking about independent consultancy, small firms, executive coaches, B2B professional service providers, as it as it may be, a lot of them, it is the owner or the president or the leader who is doing predominant effort in business development. They may not have a, a subordinate salesperson yet. And that kind of gets the question, what's your perspective? When should a company be thinking about, um, assuming the owner operator is the, the main salesperson, when should someone be thinking about, okay, I'm I'm, you know, I need to bring on somebody. Is there a, is there a point or specific types of symptoms or criteria that may occur that says, okay, if I, if I really want to level up, then I've got to do this now. What's your perspective about bringing on that first, that first salesperson and, and how to, how to identify them, how to, when, when to bring them on, how to identify them, how to onboard them. I'm just going to ask the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, uh, anything else? It, yeah, <laughs> I, I know, I know. To, to tomorrow's lottery? Yeah, um, no, any, any insight, uh, any insight yeah. you have in that, in that realm would be valuable. I always believe that a, a, an owner that's, that's evaluating whether or not they, they need to bring on more salespeople, um, getting the numbers around that, getting historical data around leads, Mm-hmm. Execution of, of your sales process, um, win rate. How often they winning? And all of a sudden, if that win rate is, is is extremely high with them, or extremely low. Meaning, you know, we're getting marketing qualified leads into the sales process, but we can't get them through the process. Right. It, you know, it could become a resource question, a yeah. time question, and I always found that. Ownership, leadership, selling have a higher win rate than your even your best salespeople. Sure, but that doesn't you know that could be that they're just not in enough sales, they're not enough deals. Yeah. So identifying right. that really, it, it, sometimes it's a look in the mirror versus a look outside the window. Mm. And, and 
are we serving these leads, which aren't cheap, right? Scott, marketing guy, getting a no. qualified lead is... No, getting a healthy pipeline is not inexpensive. It's going to cost you time, effort, and or money, and usually all three. Yeah. And are you are you dwindling those opportunities away because you just don't have the bandwidth to get to them? Right. So that's, that's to me, the, the how. And then the moving forward on it, say you have one sales rep, how do you get to two? How do you get to three? How do you get to four? Depending on a lot of different things, your business model. Are they just pure hunters? They're out, out there getting new clients. Are they hunter farmers? They have to take care of the existing clients and go get new clients. Are they geographically based? There's so many different variables that go into that that um, an organization, as they grow, has, has to determine what their coverage model will look like, what it should look like. And your coverage model aligned with your sales plan, aligned with what the productivity numbers are, will determine your headcount. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Now how you go about doing that, finding good salespeople in today's environment, tough. Yeah. Right. Well, especially as we're recording this at the end of 2021, uh, harder, harder than ever, which makes you know the work that you do that much more important in in terms of yes, finding talent, recruiting the talent, but leveraging and maximizing the talent that's already there, right? Because it is so difficult to find outside talent in your industry. I find well, I just find out even through managers I've worked with, peers, mm -hmm. those who are always recruiting. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's another one, one, another another one here. Always be, yeah. always be recruiting, always. And even if it's at trade shows, yeah, you know it's 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 out. You know, having a a, a happy hour always. You always be looking for top talent because you never know when you're going to need it. Yeah, that's a great note, and I and and it's one of those things where every when everything's going well, it's so easy to stop doing certain things that that's the exact time that those things need to be done because tomorrow things won't be going well, and you're going to wish that you had. Everybody has ups and downs and challenging years. And I remember one year at, 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 at Xerox, I came off of a, actually I was number one in the world in the product group that we represented. Wow. But uh, by that, a couple of people uh, got promoted mm -hmm. um, through performance improvement. They had some attrition. Um, and I was caught flat footed on my recruiting and because in that world, you were, we're really we're promoting from within. So you're always mm -hmm. trying to bring people into your organization. Yep. And I was caught, caught flat footed and it, it came back to bite me a little bit. And um, because it wasn't a product and it wasn't something that you could sell and get caught up with in 30 days. It was a yeah. three to six months sales cycle, relationship building. And if you're looking for someone for five months, by the time you got them on board, half the year was over and you're, you're caught in that. Yeah. Nice. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, uh, last two questions before we start to wrap up here. One is around uh, key performance indicators, KPIs. And um, our, I think most people probably have an idea for what, you know, the KPI should be in the sales world, but what's your perspective on it? Which ones do you pay most close attention to either in the sales management realm or as a salesperson, you know, as an individual salesperson, what should they be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, from a from a very high level, I, I want to start there first mm -hmm. because there might be KPIs out of the sales organization that end up on on the scoreboard or the dashboard of the company, which is obviously number of deals, size of revenue of deals, any type of mar market segmentation that you can get to. Right now, running a sales organization and having salespeople work into it. You obviously have their plan, their sales quota. Hopefully, you're giving them a sales quota. Some organizations don't, but hopefully, you're giving a sales quota. And then you're aligning you're you're aligning the underlying indicators to that. So it could be number of contacts, outbound contacts, sales calls, demos, proposals, because you're trying to to that trying. Your goal is to effectively manage the sales process, the key, and aligning those K, KPIs. To your sales process and be able to measure them. Yeah, right. Along the way. Yeah. And it, so demos, selling activities, sales calls, new leads, deals, win loss rate. So there's so many that that could that could, you can pull out of the bag. I, I would go in and say how how important is this 
to the overall picture and effectiveness of your salesperson. And if it's important, measure it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. That makes sense. And a lot if you sense. don't have the tools to measure it, invest in something to measure. Get the tools. The process yeah. in place. Yeah. Like, like, uh, like a CRM, like you were referring to before. And yeah, starting to measure it. If um, it's important, the worst thing you can do is say, these are important KPIs in the kickoff meeting and never talk about it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, that, and and uh, you say that because it happens more than anybody wants to care to admit, right? Yeah. Well, when you ask, you know, how are you measuring your salespeople? And there's no, there's not a CRM, or not only that, if there's not a CRM, what is your alternative to a CRM? Correct. Which, yeah, it's an Excel sheet. Mentioned. What is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it, it could be a lot of different things. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we're coming up on time, John. This has been a fantastic interview. Um, I'd like to end with the same question that I end to each interview, which is about lessons learned, either personally or professionally over your career. Uh, a couple, nugget, one or two nuggets of wisdom that everyone who's watching and listening might uh, might really benefit from. Wow. Um, well, lessons learned in, in, in my career. I'm going to go from a lessons learned from the clients that I've been working with so far. Yeah, that's great. Um, and and I think the, the key lessons learned there is that Two things. You you have to set the proper expectations with your salespeople. Mm. And a lot of sales planning needs to go in place and needs to be done in order for you to set those expectations. So proper expectations is, I think, fundamentally the key element to getting getting your sales organization moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And the other element is don't expect what you don't inspect. So don't expect the, what you don't inspect. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you set those expectations, align your sales management process to help guide, coach, counsel, manage your salespeople to, to make sure they're doing it. That's because right. even if you just do that fundamentally well, and maybe you're not the key chief strategist, but you just, you just have a process because these are important things to manage to, mm -hmm. I think you'll see an impact to your you know, to your top line results. That's excellent. That's excellent. Um, if someone wants to learn more about the work that you're doing, uh, if they're interested in becoming a client or they have a referral sure. for you, uh, what's the best way for them to learn more about you, get in contact? Yes. Uh, so um, email me. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, John Alden at... Uh, Jay Alden at salesacceleration.com. Um, if you like, if something spoke to you today and you have an immediate either question, concern, call me on my cell, 720-357-0009. So I'm 009, not 007. <laughs> and um, hit me up on LinkedIn. You know, Good deal. Yeah, uh, John Alden at, 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 on LinkedIn, you'll find me. Very good. And of course, uh, John and everyone will put all of those uh, contact details in the show notes so you guys can access them as you're watching this episode. Uh, John, sincerely, thank you for the time. Thank you for your expertise. Uh, I have a ton of notes. My hope is I can decipher them all, but it was great content. I can always go back and watch the recording. Um, again, thank you for your time today. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. Good. For Consulting with Authority, this is Scott Cantrell, as always, wishing you all the best of success. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor of our show, Smart Solutions Media. Smart Solutions Media empowers business owners, consultants, and other independent professionals to easily attract better prospects and transform them into long-term clients. If you're a B2B consultant or service professional and would like to start filling your pipeline with better quality prospects, visit us on the web at smartsolutionsmedia.com to learn more about what we can do to help you. Be sure to complete this short two-minute accelerated growth scorecard you can find on the website and you'll receive a complimentary strategy session where we'll give you specific insights and recommendations to help you attract high-value clients. Until next time, Make sure you are consulting with authority.